are talking about writing today and we are talking about Bangalore. Uh, so I thought I would start with a question that combines both. Uh, when you were about 35 years old, you turned down a professorship uh, at the Delhi School of Economics, uh, which I'm imagining many people would give their left arm for, and you decided to move to Bangalore to become a full-time writer. So looking back now uh, from that period, from the mid-90s I think it was to now, uh, what would you say is the one thing that has inspired you most about Bangalore as a writer, apart from Koshi's? Well, <laughs> I'm sorry you, I, you excluded Koshi's because I'll have to begin with Koshi's. Oh, okay. uh, you know, uh, Zach talked about uh, senior writers uh, whom have inspired him, and, and I've been incredibly lucky in my, in my mentors. Uh, you know, I have a very unorthodox academic and writing career. I spent the ages of uh, between 11 and 21 hoping to play cricket for India. And I played for a college team, uh, and two of my teammates did play cricket for India. But I wasn't good enough. I was studying economics, I was disastrous in economics as well. And then I stumbled upon very relevant. Then I decided to do a PhD. I had a very indulgent father who was happy to devote part of his pension. He could not buy an apartment for himself because, it, you know because of my education and I, I was mentored by and I did a PhD in the most obscure place it was uh, the IIM Calcutta I did a PhD in sociology it had a small and obscure department of sociology and since we're speaking about Bangalore the greatest ever Indian sociologist M.N. Srinivas lived in Bangalore he happened to be known to a family friend of mine who took me to meet Srinivas and Srinivas said better not study sociology at all than go to IIM Calcutta <laughs> and I defied him and went there and found a remarkable mentor called Anjan Ghosh, who is now sadly dead, who taught me almost everything I know about scholarship. But I'm coming to Koshi's in a minute. You'll have to give me a minute. Uh, and then I found various other mentors along the way, one of whom uh, was also someone who's no longer alive, uh, a philosopher called Ram Chandra Gandhi. And I hope you, I can tell a few stories before must, I come to you your must, next you question. Must, you must. Uh, because these are extraordinary people I've known, you know, who, despite my lack of... Uh, certified degree from a high quality institute, you know, have allowed me to uh, do the kinds of things I did. Ram Chandra Gandhi uh, was the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi and Sri Rajiv Gopalachari. He was, they were, that Rajaji's daughter Lakshmi married Gandhi's son Devdas. They met on a park bench or, or they fell in love on a park bench in Kavan Park, wow. as people still fall in love today. Right. <laughs> and, they wanted to get married. Their parents were closest friends and allies in the freedom struggle. Uh, but uh, this was an intercaste marriage. Falling in love was not allowed. So Rajaji and Gandhi told Lakshmi and Devdas, for five years you cannot meet. And after five years, tell us if you're still in love. They were in love. They got married. They had four children. The youngest is Gopal Krishna Gandhi, who sadly will not be the next prime minister, uh, vice president of India. Uh, the eldest is a daughter called Tara, who's alive. The next son, Raj Mohal, is a distinguished biographer whose books I'm sure Krishna uh, stalks. And the son after him was a brilliant maverick philosopher called Ram Chandra Gandhi. And uh, he was one of the people I got to know when I was starting my PhD. He was an incredibly inspirational man. Uh, he, I mean, I could tell stories about him all evening, but if you want any more, I'll come to it in a minute. But he, like me, uh, taught in all the top universities in India and, um, and abroad, but never more f for more than six months, because he couldn't last more than six months in any place. And after Oxford and Shantinikit and, and California and so on, he became, uh, he lived off his wits in, uh, in Delhi, not just off his wits, of the royalties of Rajaji's translation, his mother's Hindi translation of Rajaji's Ramayana. And he lived for many years off those royalties, Half of the royalties went to pay his alcohol bill at the Indian International Center, and the other half was spent here and there. And he wrote some very interesting books, including Sita's Kitchen, which is an incredibly, incredibly interesting meditation on the Ayodhya conflict. Uh, there are also some books of his that are possibly coming out. And I, I, I'm talking about him not just because he was an extraordinary mentor and a fund of stories and insights, but um, he lived in obscurity in Bengali market, a grandson of Rajaji and Gandhiji having turned down or being thrown out of all these jobs in top universities around the world. He lived in a one-room apartment in Bengali market, those of you who know Delhi. And he would go and have his breakfast at Nathu Sweets and then carry on to IIC and read and so on. 
As he once told me, he said, Ram, I occupy the chair of philosophy at Natu Sweets. <laughs> <laughs> and I like to think, in honoring Ramu's memory, I occupy the chair of history at Koshi's Parade's Cafe. <laughs> so that's my main connection to Bangalore. I'm sorry. And that's where we meet. Anyway. Uh, Koshi remains one of the wonderful constants. But uh, Bangalore has also changed incredibly. And I think one of the things that I sensed reading your essay about your decision to move to Bangalore was also the feeling that it is not a place where you have to be, in some sense, in the mainstream, in the capital. You don't have to be important, within quotes. So you were seemed to be attracted to the slight sense of obscurity, of lying low, of doing your own thing that Bangalore offered. Do you think that is still the case with Bangalore today, or has it changed for you? What is it like to be an intellectual in Bangalore today? Well. Uh of course, the, change is, the city has changed uh, dramatically in the last 20 odd years. I think, uh, in my view, socially it's changed for the better. Mm -hmm. It's become a more interesting place, a more diverse place. I think uh, aesthetically it's changed for the worse. Ecologically it's changed for the worse. Mm -hmm. So there are complex ways in which these changes have taken place. You know, I leave, um, you know, my decision to move to Bangalore was completely impulsive. I had this, uh, I had this offer from the Delhi School of Economics. I went to Pune for a lecture on Gandhi Jayanti, and I came back and told my wife, who ran a design company in uh, Delhi, that, look, our children were small, let's go back to Bangalore. And she said, no, 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 and so on and so forth. And then someone I admired greatly, E.P. Thompson, who was an independent historian, died, and somebody just, I just went crazy, and I just basically coerced my wife to move to Bangalore. <laughs> and it was good for me, it was good for her too. I mean, she was had a successful practice in Delhi, it should be very interesting work. But it so happened that we moved in 95 when uh, you know, Bangalore was booming in different ways and she got many interesting assignments from companies and other places in Bangalore which she would not, not have got. And of course our children were much happier. They had grand, uh, grandparents, they had cousins, they went to a wonderful school, Aditi school, they had some distinguished Aditi alumni, both part of Shunya and you know, uh, writers here. And uh, my life has uh, not changed very much because I live a fairly reclusive life. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm at home all day. Uh, the, the landmarks, uh, uh, what attracted me here were some people who have passed on. Uh, the great D.R. Nagaraj, uh, wonderfully uh, innovative and original social thinker, who was in his mid-40s when he died, and whose book, The Flaming Feet, is an enduring testimony to his brilliance. Uh, he passed on, so did some older friends of mine, I mean, Manamala's colleague, T.G. Vajanathan, uh, the brilliant, crazy, controversial, exasperating teacher of English literature. Uh, and uh, I was the only French stroke acolyte of TGV who never fought with him. Because I knew even more about cricket than he did. Yeah. All right. But he was there, so some of our friends have passed on. So some parts of life have, cha life have changed. Uh, Premier no longer exists. But Krishna and Mahi between them make up for that. So I don't miss uh, Premier. Uh, the Chinna Swami Stadium is still there. Parades are still there. And uh, it still is an incredibly livable city. And it gives you a distance from Delhi. You know, I think uh, the intellectual and media worlds of Delhi are incredibly uh, self-absorbed, self-regarding. Uh, you know, uh, someone started uh, uh, a literary magazine in Delhi and with a great fanfare, lots of top people involved in it. And uh, a friend once said that, you know, they, who, who, who was asked to write for it, that these guys think they're so self-important and their magazine is not read in the South. I said, actually, it's not even read South of Khan Market. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so uh, there's a kind of, I mean, they're very interesting people in Delhi. For young people, Delhi could be uh, interesting, diverse city. Delhi has also changed a lot since I was a student. When I was a student in the 1970s, Delhi was essentially a Sarkari city and a Punjabi refugee city. Now this has migrants from everywhere and there's a kind of buzz. But the, the, more, the more successful you become in Delhi, the more pompous and self-absorbed you become. You know, uh, you will find uh, newspaper editors only, their columns are, they're not reporters like growing here, right? Their columns are all about prime ministers and presidents and their conversation. Or if not prime ministers and presidents, at least Tom Friedman, you know. <laughs> all right, okay. Now, so I think there's a distance you have in a place like Bangalore from this kind of, of course you miss things. I mean, you miss uh, students, you miss libraries. I mean, one of the tragedies of our 
uh, our being the knowledge capital of India is we don't have a single decent public library now. Uh, so some of the things you miss. But it is a very, still a very hospitable, livable city. Mm -hmm. It's transformed a great deal. I mean, mm -hmm. I moved here in 1995, but I've known this city since I first entered Koshi's in 1962. Wow. Because my grandparents on both sides lived here, and I would come from Dehradun for holidays. So I've known it from 1962, you know, uh, which is, so uh, it's a very long time. But uh, it's wonderful what you've done here. I mean, to start this, you know, the A to Z of literature, mm -hmm. with all great writers between A and Z, Right, as teachers, uh, because it is a place that you know has a li uh, that deserves, uh, you know, it deserves a cultural life commensurate with the entrepreneurial energies that the city otherwise has. You know, I think one of the best things that happened in ba Bangalore since I moved uh, was Ranga Shankar. Mm. Right, and there should be many more. There should be many more. And I think what you're doing is, in that sense, a way of taking the city, you know. Uh, uh, of deepening the cultural life of the city. I mean, the economic, scientific life of the city is very rich. Mm -hmm. And I think this, this, this is really, uh, we'll, we'll take it the next step forward. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, coming back to the writing, Ram, you work in different forms. You, you write biographies, you write contemporary history, you write columns. Uh, and somewhere you have said that you think of yourself as a scholar first and then a writer. And I know writing as, a, as, as just practice, as craft, is very important to you. But even more important is what you are saying and doing and, and finding out through that writing. But the one thing that's interested me about your work, and it's something that I also try to grapple with as a writer of fiction, because I try and write stories and novels about things happening in today's India, is how do you combine telling the stories of the past with commenting on the present? Do you do you worry as a columnist, yeah. as as a as a TV presence, that history might prove you wrong? Of course, of course. And you know, uh, uh, I said this yesterday in another talk I gave. So, with apologies to the few people who were there in the audience yesterday. You know, uh, clearly my tweets are more opinionated uh, than my newspaper columns, and my newspaper columns are more opinionated than my books, than my essays, uh, and then my essays. I hope. Yeah. I hope my books are even less opinionated than my essays. But my <coughs> books are carried by the weight of scholarship. You know, mm -hmm. research in the archives, new materials, new ways of bringing it together. But you know, living in a society as complex, as divided, as cacophonous as ours, you feel compelled to intervene. Uh, and you know, sometimes uh, I do say things uh, that uh, are proved wrong, or are injudici injudicious, or simplistic in my popular writings. I'm sure. But I hope that the books, which is really what one, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, it's the books that would that would be the legacy that I hope would would live on. But having said that, you know, I think I also I work in many genres, but I also do not work in many genres. Right now, I could never write a poem. I could never write a novel. I tried once, by the way. Oh really? Yeah, 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 oh. Yeah, yeah. oh my god! Yeah, yeah, yeah I tried <laughs> once. First time I heard of it. Yeah. When was this? Well, uh, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll give you the background to this. Uh, uh, I think it's, it's, it's amusing uh, uh, slice of literary history. So, and there's some young people here. So let me let, let me tell you the story. Ruko Nadwani, who is a famously reclusive editor, but India's finest editor, used to be at Oxford University Press and now runs permanent black India's best social science outfit, wrote a piece in the in a very good southern literary magazine, which is now dead, called the Indian Review of Books, which is much better than the Khan Market one I, I mentioned. <laughs> he wrote a piece called Academics as Writers. I think the year was, when I was moving to Bangalore, it was 94 or 90, 94 or 95. Yeah. He wrote a piece called Academics and Writers, and it was about three people, uh, Amitabh Ghosh, Mukul Keshavan, and me. Now, uh, literature, the young people here will soon, uh, will soon know, if they haven't already found out, that literature is notoriously nepotistic. It's all about cabals and promoting your friends. <laughs> so Rukun Adwani wrote this piece about three writers who had been with co in college with him. <laughs> and it was, it was called Academics as Writers. And the argument was, Ghosh had a PhD, Gua had a PhD, Keshavan had an MLIT. Uh, not a PhD, but an advanced research degree. And here were three scholars who also wrote you know, books for a wider audience. And this piece of... Uh, um, friendly promotion, shall we say, <laughs> or promotion of friends, uh, ended, uh, written entertainingly and wittingly and, wittily and so on, because it was Rukun Adwani, ended by saying, Ghosh has written four novels, Keshavan has published his first novel, and given 
the flair with which Guha writes his non-fiction, I'm sure he will also write a novel. So I took this seriously, you know, because the funny is saying I can become a novelist. So <laughs> I thought of a couple of plots. I think I wrote about five or six pages. And then I said, I mean, there are some Hindi speakers in this room. There's a Hindi expression or a Hindustani expression. Mere bas ki nahi hai. Right? This is way, way beyond me, right? So uh, uh, I think it's important for a writer to know also what they can do and what they cannot do. And this is particularly, uh, uh, it's cautionary uh, the older you get. Because you think you know everything, you know. Uh, uh, you should know in your columns what you can comment on, what you can't comment on, what your boundaries are. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, clearly you won't always respect it. Clearly, you occasionally you transgress into areas in which you lack the competence or the flair or the intuitive understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's very important for young people as they grow. I mean, when they are young, they'll do everything. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. You experiment into different things. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, I mean I'm, as you know, I'm a fan of Hindustani classical music, right? And. Uh, you go, you in my um, people of my generation. You would go to a Shobha Gurtu concert to your Tumris. You didn't want her to sing Khayals, right? And you would go to Malikarjun Mansur for a different reason, right? So I think you will find as you go along that of course you vary. I mean, Malikarjun would sing a Khayal and he would also sing a, you know a Kannada folk song. So you can vary a bit, but you must know uh, uh, the limits of uh, your abilities and your instincts and your orientations. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there is a tendency now to talk about literature, uh, and maybe I'm guilty of this myself sometimes, to talk of literature only in terms of craft and style. Uh, and uh, you can apply that to anything. You can apply that to nonfiction. You can apply that to reportage. You can, but literature, when we say literature, and I'm now thinking mostly about fiction, the novel, uh, or, or, or poetry, is also a different set of values in some way from the writing of history or the writing of journalism. Uh, and uh, of course, you've counted among your friends, uh, uh, you are Anantamurti, who I think reflected very deeply on what can literature do. I mean, he was also very interested in politics and he was writing extensively, commenting, even involved personally in politics. But somewhere or the other, he would always come back to yeah. the values that he can bring to these questions uh, about being a modern Indian through literature. And I, I, I'm fascinated particularly by his novel Bharat, Bharatipura, which we've talked about. Um, and there's, there's just this one moment in it, a very minor character who Jagan, the hero, goes to meet. Um, and this is a few years after independence. And, uh, and this minor character, Desai, was involved in a marginal way in the, in, the, in the freedom movement, but he didn't play any decisive role in it. And he says that when we got freedom, I realized that even if we hadn't, if I hadn't done anything, we would have got freedom. Yes. So what is the role of the individual in history? And he says, history rolls on even if we are not there. Uh, and, I, and I'm fascinated, yeah. and, and as, a, as a fiction writer, I'm always fascinated in this, in this, in this little man, this insignificant <laughs> character. And you've, writ you've written about uh, a lot of uh, significant people. You've written about people who've actually yeah, yeah. made history. Yeah. Uh, so how, what do you think of that, um, I mean, I don't know, dynamic or the, this question of yeah. the ordinary individual, s historically, seemingly insignificant person, man or woman? You see, uh, <laughs> that's a what I mean, I, I don't recall. I read Bhartipura many, many years ago. And so I don't recall that. I mean, it's, it's also very, very poignant and interesting to say that, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know what the contemporary version of that would be, you know. Uh, lots of people got lynched, tied into the lynching, but it still happened, right? Or something <laughs> gross and barbaric like that. But uh, I have written about, of course, my first book was about peasants. Mm -hmm who actually made history, right? Mm. So the peasants of the Jipko movement mm. who protested against, you know, commercial fairing and uh, brought the environmentalism of ordinary people into not just Indian but global understanding and debate. So I think there are circumstances in which uh, ordinary people make history. Uh, they're also, the older I get, the more I appreciate quiet acts of dignity and compassion and heroism mm. you know, within a family, within a community, within a village, within a school, you know. Uh, the two professions I most admire are those of the teacher and the doctor. I know they are corrupt teachers and avaricious doctors. But a good teacher and a good doctor uh, can transform lives in a way in which you and me can never do it. Mm -hmm. However successful our books are, however many copies we sell, right? Mm -hmm. So I think these quiet acts, so uh, 
Uh, but at, at the other level of the scale, there are times when uh, powerful uh, individuals can make history. I was just before uh, you know, before we met today. I was having a conversation with a journalist missing from Delhi. Uh, you know, a kind of uh, foreigner who's just come on an assignment, and he just wanted to meet. And I was telling him. Uh, about individuals, he asked this question about individuals in history, and he talked about Modi. And I said, look, I tell you one instance in, in the history I've studied, where an individual changed history for the better, and that is Nehru mm -hmm. between August 15, 1947, and 26 January 1950. Mm -hmm. If Nehru, there were others with him. I mean, there were many, many other people with him. Mm -hmm. But if Nehru had not firmly articulated the view as Prime Minister and been willing to risk not only his post but his life for the view that India will not be a Hindu Pakistan, we would not be here today. Let me tell you that clearly. He is absolutely, from the first letter he wrote uh, to the Chief Ministers of Provinces after 1947, which said, however the Pakistani state treats Hindus and Sikhs, we have to treat Muslims here in a civilized manner. And then of course after Gandhi's death, when Patel and Nehru were modified and buried their differences and then together, you know. So I think there are periods when, uh, and of course Ambedkar from a different point of view, in giving dignity and self-respect to the oppressed. So there are moments, and when individuals can uh, change history in a nasty way, Hitler being the most extreme example, but also Stalin and Mao. But I think, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I don't, even quiet acts of solidarity, compassion, heroism, instruction, you know, I think are very, very significant. And what you will do through this writing program is you will open the minds of young people. And they don't know how, I mean, that's been my experience from people I've encountered. I mentioned Anjan Ghosh, my first teacher. I mentioned Ramchandra Gandhi. I could take many, many other names. Uh, in the new edition of, uh, you know, editors who've read me, uh, you know. And I think it's, uh, the, in that sense, no, every individual life is unique and no individual life is insignificant. I think, of course, that's, that's something, uh, that's something fiction writers know much better than historians, because historians deal in aggregates. I mean, they deal, they talk about class and the state and technology and large, you know, globalization, capitalism, they deal in kind of abstract large aggregates. But every fiction writer knows. That's why fiction writers write about mm. distinctive mm -hmm. yeah. But talking about quiet acts of dignity, uh, one sort of thread that I've noticed in your work, uh, starting, of course, with your wonderful biography of Mary Elwin, which I'm reading far too many years too late, but I'm enjoying hugely. Uh, also, your, your collection of essays, Anthropologists Among the Marxists, where you talk about your PhD in Calcutta among some sort of stellar uh, uh, Marxist scholars, uh, going on to the this sort of extensive biography of Gandhi that you're working on, is that you seem to have a fascination for the the sort of the the, the sort of ascetic uh, frugal sort of figure who who uh, and you and you talk about uh, I remember particularly this portrait uh, in your uh, anthropologist among the Marxists of Samar Sen, yeah, yeah. Uh, the editor yeah. who who just yeah. had absolutely no interest in in material things. That's right. Yeah. That seems. I, I mean, already you say at the beginning of that essay collection that some of these figures and some of these essays are already anachronistic. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And and then you uh, the the Elwin biography was already written before that. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and now you're working on Gandhi. So I mean, how do you combine these two things? Your fascination for a kind of a, a, uh, attitude and outlook on life that just seems uh, impossible even to uh, justify in, in, in today's world? Well, I suppose, uh, you know, it is practiced. Hmm. You know, uh, you know, they are sadhus, uh, they are holy men and they are holy men. Right? Is it recognized, still recognized as heroic? Uh, it could be in some ways. Uh, you know, I... Uh, and I'm sure, you know, there are people, uh, for example, still in the Gandhian movement. Mm. There is a person uh, whom I've got to know, and maybe I shouldn't, I don't know him well. I've met him three or four times. Mm. You know, I am an agnostic. Mm. I am, uh, uh, as the great sociologist uh, Max Weber said, I'm religiously unmusical. <laughs> I, I'm not anti-religious, you know. I find Richard Dawkins impossibly crude and vulgar in his arguments, mm. on, in defense of atheism. So, but I recognize the subtlety and beauty of many religious traditions, the great uh, music and architecture, they, and you know, the kind of consolation they give to people. But I'm an agnostic. I don't go to a temple. I detest, I mean, among, uh, I'm, 
uh, had many public quarrels in my life, right? I, um, and in different, now that I'm old and I've had probably 50 or 100 public quarrels, uh, I'd say there may be one or two I regret. There are about 50 or 60 I'm reconciled to, and about five or six I'm really proud of. And one of the public quarrels I'm really proud of was with Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. Oh. All right. Who is a charlatan and a humbug, right? And, and I've not had the good fortune to quarrel with Baba Ramdev yet, but if you give it a chance, I'll go there, right? Now, but at the same level, this, this is a long while reminder way of answering your question about quiet heroism. I've got to know recently, not well, uh, and I don't want to put this a Tamil word drishti on him and what he does, so I won't mention him. He is, I've got to, he is a monk who runs a small, a small but beautiful temple somewhere in South India. So I don't want to identify beyond that. And it so happens that that small temple somewhere in South India is on our route to, very beautiful old historic temple, is somewhere our route to uh, a, a close family member of mine, a friend member of mine. So I visited and I went to the temple and I stumbled into the monk's ashram. And it's an extraordinary figure. I mean, it's just absolutely extraordinary. I mean, every meeting with him, leaves me, uh, you know, more reflective, less egotistic. And uh, my daughter, who's fiercely atheistic, I took her there also, because we, she had to visit the same family member. I said, come, the temple is beautiful. And after we saw the beautiful, she said, I said, just come and see the monk. And we went in, and uh, he, she chatted, and she's going to America. And he, I mean, he, and he, people of his order, he's from a particular order, and every time I've gone to see him, ordinary folks from that order have come to him. They're waiting to ask him, you know, maybe there's a bereavement, maybe there's some tragedy, maybe the child does not want to follow the father's profession. And, you know, he truly is a person of faith and compassion, right? And he's the other end from Sisi Ravi Shankar, right? Now, uh, uh, and so they would be, so the thing is that I think there are people like this, mm. absolutely. I mean, apart from teachers, noble teachers and noble doctors, mm. there are people like this, mm. I mean, and social workers. And this is just one such, one such character, you know, I mean, it is just, uh, uh, at the other level with the Dalai Lama, who also is a little bit like that, right? who of course is much more famous, but mm -hmm. this person is just a small temple in a small part of South India, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, he, the order he is, uh, of which he is nominally head, I mean, like most monks, he became celebrated. I mean, by the way, he, uh, so what are we interested so in Varavala, in the, you know, he's read uh, the, the Malayalam, uh, Kannada, I mean, he's read all these little, little, little literature, you know, and he's, he's a very curious, interesting fellow, you know. So, uh, I think you will find uh, mm. this kind of person around. Mm. Mm. You know, you may stumble upon them, mm. you know, uh, uh, but they are there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, since you mentioned... Uh, and again, again, yeah. you see, it's like this. Samar Babu uh, or Chandi mm -hmm. Prasad, but the great Chipko mm -hmm. leader, who I've also written about at length, were much older than me. So they would have been uh, <coughs> 20, 30 years older than me. Mm -hmm. This monk is 20 years younger than me. Mm -hmm. But he inspires me in the same way as the older people did. Mm -hmm. you know? So I think... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, talking about a younger person who inspired you, uh, I want to come back to D.R. Nagaraj, a, yeah. a name that you mentioned yeah. earlier in the conversation. Yeah. And I think many people in this room uh, either have heard of him or ought to, ought to go back to his work. Um, you've had some very interesting conversations with him, some of which you record in, in your essays. Um, and he was, among the many things he was interested in was, one of the things was, how do you represent a sort of pre-modern, or I don't want to use the word anti, but outside, the perspective of people sort of outside the Western rationalist, modernist perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the question I, I wanted to ask you is that you've written about bilingualism, you've written about the bilingual intellectual. What do you think is the single uh, most significant thing that one misses working as an intellectual and a writer only in English? I, I see, uh, Anjum, I always hesitate picking one thing. Mm. You, know, you one can pick two. One, or even two or five, because I think there are many. Yeah. You know, I think there is a loss mm. uh, of, mm. uh, you know, conversation mm. across languages mm. on both sides. Mm. So, you know, Kannada writers who don't, uh, who are, I mean, Anantamurti could mm. transcend the divide. I mean, Sugata and Manabala can transcend that divide. But many people, many Kannada writers can't, you know. And I think so it's missed on both sides. Mm. Uh, about D.R. Nagaraj, I didn't know him well. Mm. I met him half a dozen times. Mm. And I was just getting to know him when he died. And I met him the day he, before, we were at Koshi's for about two hours. And talk about asceticism, I was drinking coffee and he was drinking rum, which is kind of, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and he died 
later that night he, had, uh, he was taken to hospital that that's actually uh, but you know um, uh, they obviously you see, I'll, I should first answer your question on language you know you have to make do with your limitations mm -hmm. like uh, clearly you have to understand I mean I'm 60 I can't learn a new language mm -hmm. right uh, uh, I could I suppose I mean uh, the, the brilliant muckraking uh, American journalist I have stoned uh, learned Greek at 70, write about Socrates. Right. Maybe I you know, don't have that courage or recklessness. I would ra rather write the books I have to write, right? So uh, you, uh, you can't make up for that. I mean, I do, uh, one of the things I miss, one of the things that has been a loss to me in moving to Bangalore is that my Hindi has got rusty. Because I had uh, functional knowledge of Hindi. I also did some translations. Okay. Uh, but 25 years away from the Hindi belt, and I certainly don't want to listen to Astak to improve my Hindi. <laughs> right. Now, uh, I have lost that. So I think they are, clearly there is a uh, young, young writers who are younger than me who have more flair in learning languages. Try and learn more than one language. And it both, I mean, the loss is also at the Indian language side. I mean, that, as I argue in that essay, it's not just people like you and me. It's also uh, a Malayalam writer who is 40 is less likely to be conversant with the Western canon than a Malayalam writer of 60 or 70. Mm, At both true. levels, there's been a separation, right? Uh, so I think this is to be, con but I want to say one thing about Diyar Nagarath, and where I miss him, and where not I miss him, I think India misses him. You know, uh, because he could converse across the language. You know, one of the interesting things about, uh, 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 and I, 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 let me uh, rephrase this. I'm working on a biography of Gandhi, right? Now, in the second volume of my biography, which is why now I'm finishing, a major figure is B.R. Ambedkar. Now, I won't tell you what's there in the biography about American Gandhi, but in India in 2017, it's common to posit them as rivals. Right? And it's particularly common among Dalit intellectuals in some parts of India. Uh, it's also common among, was common among the Hindu right. Arun Shori wrote a truly obnoxious book about, uh, uh, about Ambedkar uh, in 1996. In 2000, uh, I called Arundhati Roy the Arun Shori of the left. And I was entirely validated when in 2012 or 14, she wrote an equally obnoxious book about attacking Gandhi. In the same simple black and white way in which Shori had attacked Ambedkar, right? So there is this polarization of Gandhi and Ambedkar. And one of the interesting things I have noted anecdotally wandering around Karnataka is that the Dalit and Bahujan intellectuals of Karnataka at least the most prominent ones have shown us a way of admiring both Gandhi and Ambedkar, which is the right and creative and historically accurate way. Because social change takes place only when there's pressure from above and from below. And Gandhi was the most radical reformer from of the upper caste tradition. Ambedkar was the greatest emancipator from below. They had differences, they had rivalries, they had philosophical divergences, but ultimately, historically, they were playing complementary roles. And there is no reason for an Indian in 2017 to choose between the two. You can admire more, one more than the other. You can say Ambedkar was a greater figure, but you cannot deny Gandhi's major role in delegitimizing untouchability. No upper caste Hindu did more than him than to delegitimize untouchability. Now, this profound insight is recognized by Devanur Mahadeva, uh, by Siddharingaya, uh, but there is no DR Nagaraj to take it forward to the wider world. That's where I'm missing most, because, you know, the crudities and the simplicities of the Kancha Ilayas and the Arundhati Roys, DR Nagaraj would have finished them in half an hour. Because his understanding of India, of culture, of Gandhi, uh, of Ambedkar, his turn of phrase in English would have matched any of them, right? That's where I miss him most. That Devanur and Siddharingaya and others like them. I mean, people here would know others. But one of the interesting things is that in Karnataka, they are not, Gandhi and Ambedkar are not polarized. And that's the right and the most culturally sensitive way of going about it. Now, I don't know why this is so. In Maharashtra, it's totally, Maharashtra and UP, Dalit intellectuals have a visceral hatred of Gandhi. Which is mystifying. And I've, you know, I've also said, you know, that the fellow has been dead 60 years. How does abusing him so viciously help you today? Okay. And it's also historically inaccurate, but forget that. So I think, you know, this is somewhere where D.R. Nagaraj would have provided a nuance and a complexity to this great epic debate between Gandhi and Ambedkar. Uh, maybe some younger writers who know Kannada and English can, but whenever I've either heard or read um, I've heard, you know, some of these writers, I mentioned Kannada writers, mm -hmm. talk about the complementarity, 
uh, seen reports in the press, uh, or the English language translation, Sita Langa has autobiography talks about it, right? And I think this is something where it's really tragic. I mean, we don't need to choose between Gandhi and Ambedkar. Mm -hmm. Certainly, we need to choose between Gandhi and Godse, right? Mm -hmm. Or Ambedkar and the Shankaracharya, certainly, right? But this is a tragic and false choice foisted upon us by pernicious ideologues. And I think D.R. Nagaraj would have uh, been able to greatly assist uh, uh, the forces of reason, tolerance, and sanity in this regard, apart from all his other literary contributions. I mean, this is where I politically miss him is here. But staying with the question of language, uh, one thing, Ram, about, about your essays and, and, and even your books uh, is that there is a tremendous sense of joy and pleasure and humor and warmth in your writing. Uh, and just reading uh, the Elvin biography, for instance, I mean, he himself is such a vivacious figure, uh, full of humor, full of sort of literary asides, uh, always able to see himself in a selfless, sort of self-deprecating light. But I wanted to ask you about, about your style. Uh, you have spoken about mentors, but you've not necessarily spoken about literary mentors, people who shaped you uh, as a writer. And, and, and yeah. w were they Indian? Were you channeling an Indian tradition? Were you channeling a British tradition? Or did it have nothing to do with countries? Was it more yeah. idiosyncratic? You know, yeah. yeah. yeah uh, uh, one of uh, uh, the great advantages of turning down the professorship at the Delhi School and moving here uh, and becoming living of my wits is that it liberated me from academic reading. You know, Foucault's the rage. You have to read the uh, you have to read Foucault. You know, uh, there's a debate in the journal of comparative social linguistic and eco so philosophical uh, so please follow it right it liberated you from that you could find your own way meander read if a good recent book by a fine scholar read it right don't in but and that's how i found my way and my mentors or the writers who influenced me are a very strange lot but united by i suppose independence of mind and i'll come to what else they united by a sense of humor but so very relevant mm -hmm. Uh, the great naturalist M. Krishnan. And I think the book of mine that has given me most pleasure is not one I've written, but the anthology of M. Krishnan's writings, Nature Spokesman, that I edited. I mean, M. Uh, Krishnan, I mean, uh, uh, M. Krishnan, I met two extraordinarily talented Indian writers in my life. One is Vikram Seth, mm -hmm. and the other is M. Krishnan. And it was M. Krishnan's tragedy that he, he was so much older than Vikram Seth that there was no global market for his writing, there were no Indian publishers, and he had to make a living by writing columns. And he never wrote a proper book, and my anthology, I think, is the closest to a... But he was an extraordinary figure. I mean, uh, so he had subtlety, richness, range. Uh, he was a son of the, a pioneering Tamil novelist. He wrote in Tamil himself. He wrote a great essay on Sangam poetry, which was published in uh, Civil Lines. So he also had this humor flair. So Elwin, M. Krishnan, E.P. Thompson, whom I mentioned, and the American polymath and environmental scholar Lewis Mumford, mm -hmm. and C.L.R. James, mm -hmm. uh, of course, the great historian of cricket and of uh, Marxism. So these are the kind of five people I would regard as uh, uh, who, when I between the ages of let's say twenty and thirty, mm -hmm. you know, diff and of course very different kind of mm -hmm. uh, who I read and reread. And among the things that, in retrospect, I realized, among the things that united them, apart from independence of mind, wide range of interests, sense of humor ability to knock yourself was each of them wrote one novel that flopped. <laughs> <laughs> so which is a caution for me never write a novel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I so say, you know, but you know, if you are, you know, it's astonishing uh, the conformism in the academy, you know, and it changes from decade to decade. So I mean, at, I mean, at the kind of cult of Edward Said, you know, interesting man, but for God's sake, he was not Karl Marx. Or let alone Max Weber, you know. Uh, so the, every decade, then Derrida, right? Then somebody else. I don't know who it is now. For sure, I'm out of it. I think being on your own liberates you from that. You find your own way, your own paths, your own meta mentors, your own icons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. how, how are we doing on time? Because I have a few. Okay, okay. So then I will ask the last question or two more questions. Two, three. Two, three. Okay. Uh, Ram, Ram, you have you have said that uh, the first generation of Indian politicians. Hmm. Uh, or, or, the, or the early generations 
were both politicians and political thinkers who wrote. Many of them, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I've recently been reading Discovery of India. Uh, again, much, much later than I ought to have, I think. Tra traveling with following fish. Follow following, following, following fish. fish, following yeah. fish. Uh, and uh, so, so, so writers like that, uh, what, what would you say is sort of the best thing to take from this new genre? What kind of advice would you give to writers who want to contribute to good nonfiction writing? You know, uh, I'd say totally immerse yourself. Don't think of the market. Don't think of the audience. Don't think of becoming famous. And especially don't think of how to become famous in the West. Yes. Right? That may happen accidentally, yeah. incidentally, yeah. and good luck to you. Yeah. Right? Uh, uh, because I've seen writers who have written very good first books uh, who have changed when they're writing the second and third books along, along these directions. Uh, and I think you have just have to, you know, you have to just, it's, it's a craft, it's a passion, it's diligent, you have to be resolute and not to follow fashion. Uh, uh, and uh, it, may, it may come or it may not come. You see, no one can tell about the fate of a book. You know? I mean, uh, I've written many books. And I don't think their books, uh, I think, are better than book A is better than book B. But book B may have sold 10 times as much as book A. I mean, you, you can't say, right? So, uh, but you must, uh, I think you must uh, think, obviously, of the reader. But you must give it your all. Mm -hmm. You know, there is no, you can't be, you know, uh, I mentioned doctors. Now, I was at one stage seeing a GP. Uh, and it turned out that he was a member of the Karnataka Golf, KGN played golf. And I came home, and my wife, who's a designer, who lives design even more intensely than I live, literature or scholarship, said, a good doctor cannot be a golfer. <laughs> and she's dead right. Yeah. She's dead right, right? I mean, he may be a good golfer, but not that he won't be a good doctor, right? right? I mean, these are, these, are, these are writing, like medicine, like teaching, you know, it's a vocation. And it has to be lived lift completely, uh, like art, like music, right? Now, most professions are not like that. You know, I know people who have a wonderful, what is called work-life balance, you know, who do a good, sincere, honest job in a government office, in a company, in a law firm, and then go for, go for safaris, you know, play golf. Read, read poetry, play golf, <laughs> or do more interesting, go hiking, right? But it's very, very tough. Uh, you may take the occasional break. You may take a two-week break. I mean, if there's a test match in Bangalore, I'm not reading or writing for five days. Right? Not at all. Right? That's the day. I take a full break. Right? Now, uh, but uh, that's the main thing. And don't really worry about fame and success and audience. You know? Immerse yourself totally. You know? And that's really, uh, uh, that's really what I would say. It's not a basic advice. But yeah, 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 yeah. I think we have to now let the audience... Uh, ask all the questions about cricket that they want to. Uh, but thank you so much, Ram. I mean, we've been talking about the art of writing and the art of literature, but there has also been on display the art of speaking. And it's always so illuminating and, and enjoyable to listen to you, Ram. Thank you so much. <laughs>